You are listening to Be The Change, a podcast of conversations with true visionaries who are creating new paradigms for a healthier planet and society. I am your host, Christine Demick, and my work is in finding real solutions to the biggest problems we face today, climate crisis, capitalism, social injustices, and our failing health. There are amazing humans out there that have answers, and it is my mission to have their voices heard. Together, we can raise consciousness and create a just and equal society. Together, we can be the change. Fabrice Nolair is the founder of Darwin and one of only 20 people in the world studying sperm whales. He has recorded hundreds of clicks and codas from pods all over the world, hoping to someday translate them into a language that land-walking mammals can understand. Today, he shares with us his incredible experiences with these magnificent creatures and how understanding and respecting them is key to the egalitarian world we seek as changemakers. Welcome, Fabrice. I am thrilled to have you here today to discuss these incredible keepers of the sea. I so appreciate the time you're giving us before you go on expedition again. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, too. I'm very happy uh, to be there to uh, to, uh, give my point of view about uh, the world to the U.S. audience. Wonderful, wonderful. Can can you start back in 2007? Because I think, you know, this podcast is about being the change. And I think that everyone has this time, this moment when, you know, it's like, aha, this is what my lifetime is here for and something that I must do. And you had that in 2007 you had your first whale encounter, your first sperm whale encounter. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think it's like any intuition, you know, when there is some events in life that connect, you know, our memories and all these things make sense and you say, wow, that's exactly that and I have to do something. So at sea with a friend uh, on a sailboat and uh, at this time, you know, I did study engineer, I was working in a big company and two buildings. And I didn't even have an interest in whale. You know, I was just going back for a weekend and we met this whale at sea. And we just decided to go in the water. And I didn't even knew what kind of whale it was, but it was just incredible. You know, we're out of nowhere. There was no land. It was uh, very offshore. And when we went to the water, it was like getting in this other planet, you know, getting like these 20 massive animals, like, 60 tons coming next to you. And this very magical moment where uh, you feel everything is okay, you know, I don't have to be scared, they are gentle. You know, there's a lot of things happening, like this eye contact, these moves, that showed us they, they were very careful and they were as curious as... So it was a very magical moment with a lot of strange things happening, like uh, the mother coming with her baby, the baby uh, touching us and the mother looking at it. Some things that you don't expect to happen, you know, with wild animals. And a lot of sounds. So I was in the water and I saw, felt all these sounds coming all around me. And I didn't know what it was really. It was very powerful because we felt it in our body. And uh, then when I went back after this trip, uh, we spent almost one hour in the water with the whale. I was just going on Google and see, what is this? You know, I, so at this time, it was like prehistory. It was this uh, Argentic camera in the water, plastic, you know, so we just had these two very bad shots of it. And I was looking, okay, what kind of well is this? And then I, it popped up, it was sperm. And then it started to raise my interest because I was looking about this big animal that is mobilic, in fact, that uh, is supposed to be able to kill people, that is eating sharks, that is diving 2,000 meters, that is basically the biggest predator that ever existed on Earth. And this didn't make sense with the kind of encounter we had, huh? And after I was documenting a bit more, I discovered that these guys were killed like massively in the 20th century, that they live 80 years, that they have big brains. And I say, it doesn't even make sense. You know, if you go in Africa and you go to see an elephant, uh, and that all his family has been killed, I think the first thing the elephant is doing is running after you uh, because you think you're dangerous. And these guys were totally okay. And what really blew my mind and that's where I talk about an intuition is when I saw the scientific aspect of it, their brain, um, I had uh, some knowledge about the brain because when I was an engineer, I did my thesis uh, in the lab doing computing about 
of brain. So basically, it was using at this time, it was 30 years ago now, an algorithm that was developed by the American Air Force to do new radar. And they wanted to use it in the lab to understand how the neurons were connected in the brain. So as the computer, the first computer in the 90s, trying to use this algorithm to see where in the brain it was activating when the people were seeing colors, for instance. So I had to work on it for six months and I had some knowledge of what is the brain, what is the neuron. I'm not a biologist, but as an engineer working in a brain lab, and what I saw of the brain of spare worms was, wow, I didn't expect it was possible. The brain was so much more complex than the human brain. There was all this cortex, there was all these things that are supposed to be the, the place where we have I don't like to say the intelligence, but the cognitive ability, we say in a scientific way, but it's what it is, you know, it's the ability to be conscious, to think, to all these things. Well, obviously they're smarter than us. And obviously, I think that, I mean, one of the things, they, they speak digitally, right? Uh, so that's a, a way to image it. So I would say yes and no. Why I talk about digital, it's because it's a good parallel, because when we talk as humans, we have a, something that we are very proud of, that is language. If you think about the Bible, the beginning of the Bible is to say, wow, God came and he gave us the language, so we are the king. And the beginning was the world, so we got it, we are the humans, <laughs> we are the king. Now we can do whatever we want to everybody because we have a language. Okay, that's nice. But if you think about it, what we do is we put sound one after each other to make words, to create friends. It's quite a slow process, you know, because uh, if we calculate in mathematics how much information we can give in English, talking normally, doing this code with 26 letters and some words, and after, we can do 30 bytes per second. So 30, 0, and 1, that is the digital concept. It's very slow, you know, now if we say uh, when we're in the 80s, we're at kilobytes, and after, and 30 bytes. So you see 30 bytes is nothing. Because it's not a good system, you know. And after we went to the computer, and before the computer, I don't know if you remember the beginning of internet, we were using this, this uh, little modem, that is called modulation, demodulation. But basically what it is, you take information and you compress it in a short amount of time. You send it digitally on the line. And after on the other side, you decompress it. So it's like zip and zip. And then you have your information. And echolocation is exactly that. You, you wow. send a, a click, you receive a click that is one millisecond, and then expand on the information. So it's kind of a file, it's kind of something that is very short in time, but still contains a lot of information. So that's why I love the parallel to digital, but it's not digital. But you can compare it to what we call zip or zip or modulation, demodulation. It's kind of a system where you, you're not limited by time because you send the same amount of information maybe we sent in two minutes talking in one millisecond. And then it opened the door to a lot of other things. For instance, the whale, they can listen to other whale at hundreds of kilometers. So you think about yourself, okay, if I'm a whale, I can hear hundreds of whales, thousands of dolphins. So first, I have to be able to pick up what I want in all this. It's like if you were in New York, you would hear all the conversation of the people in New York. Complicated. But then yes. you can ask yourself this question, two questions. As humans, we have a protocol to talk that is the conversation. What is the conversation? It's something that is very codified. That's the first thing we learn to children. We say, you don't talk when I talk. Because if one is talking at the same time, it doesn't work. So we are very limited. We can do one-to-one. -one. And to understand each other, we have to look at each other. So I'm turning my face, look at this guy, say, hey, I'm talking to you. And now we have to try not to interrupt each other. That is difficult on Zoom when there is delay, by the way. <laughs> so imagine all the limitations of this protocol. It's not so fancy, you know, it's not the incredible thing. So my first will with this uh, project is not really every, every time people ask me, oh, you want to talk with the whale or you want to understand the whale language? I don't know. I'm a dreamer. Yeah, maybe. But just open the door. Just open the idea that maybe you are not the one that have the more efficient way to communicate on this planet. And this guy have a bigger brain. 
they are behaving differently. And even if they are next in the ocean, they are not doing bitcoins or building planes, maybe they are able to communicate a very, very high way that we are not understanding at all because we just listen instead of echolocating. And I think the philosophical concept of it is very, very high because if you talk with people, we are teach that the humans are the top of everything and then we can do everything. And we deny everything about the animals. We deny their, their rights, we deny their consciousness, we deny their suffering, their emotions. Less and less, but still, you know, there is a lot of people that just don't want to talk about it. And then if you come with an animal that is the, would be the ambassador, you know, the one that is the more easy to show him, we are able to be 50 years to doing this guy and even not able to understand they are so smart and they have an incredible way to communicate. I think it will make us very, very careful in the future about what we think about the other animals. Okay, so, so there's so much to unpack here. There's so much to discuss. I want to go back a little bit, if you don't mind, to where you, when you had that first encounter, and I would love for you to, first of all, explain what a click is and what a coda is. Let's listen to these codas and creeks that you recorded about five years ago. A whale click is as high as 235 decibels. And to put that into perspective for humans, 180 would deafen us. 235 would kill us. And when you had that encounter, they did clicks, but they knew not to kill you. Why do you think that is? So the, the first thing uh, we, uh, we have to understand, they can do up to. It's not they have to do it when you are here, but it's measured. So there is even this legend, but this recording of sciences, and I did one of what is called a gunshot, so, so a sound they used to kill. So it's a, something that was measured by hydrophone, but they don't use it with you, you know. It's, uh, it's like they don't, they don't want to hurt you. So when they are with you, for sure, they're not doing this level of sound. And the second thing you have to understand, this sound is very focused. It's like uh, if you have a lamp, you can have this lamp that has a very narrow, narrow beam of light, to my light, for instance, and you can choose to light on the uh, specific place. Or you can have this lamp that is light everywhere. Their system, when they want to be very powerful, they choose to do this beam of sound on something that's very, it's like a laser. So for sure, they don't use it on you, but sometimes they use it a bit. I know some people that were behaving bad with sperma, for instance, they were on the boat and jump in front of a mother and a calf. And the guy, they just sent the sound and the guy were bloating from their ears and they were at the hospital. So they got this uh, shock wave of sound that stunned them, disoriented them, and they had even some little hemorrhage. So they definitely can do it, but I don't think when I was with them, they wanted to hurt us. But with a sperm whale for sure, I think can be, you, you can kill you. I'm quite convinced of it without even you seeing it. Just at a distance. Yeah. Here is the sound you call a gunshot, which is used by sperm whales on their prey. Let's listen. My approach is also based on a relationship. So when I do an expedition, I don't say, okay, I see this whale, I try to get it today, and then I will find another whale tomorrow. I make the, the bet that I will build a relationship with these people based on some days and to show I'm respectful because babies are very curious, but the adults, they don't really want to let you go. But if they see you behave differently, they do it. And that works. So when I go with a whale, I don't say I want to have a good experience. I always say I want the whale to have a good experience and then she come back to me the day after. And sometimes it takes four or five days, but to just 
explain it, it's like there is this baby, we are doing something, say, oh, I want to go to see the humans. And then we're, we don't have time, we have to go turn the screen. Please, mom, I want to do this. No, you didn't do your homework. Okay, yeah, you, you're not going to. And after five days, okay, go for it. It's okay. So it's always the same thing. If you let them time, if you're respectful, time is also sometimes just two minutes. You know, if you jump 500 meters from the well and there are two minutes to exchange with each other, and they say, okay, go for it. But if you jump right in front of them, there's no time for them to discuss it, to talk about it. It's just your annoying human again trying to bother them and they, they go away. So even while I'm with Dolphin, I always go far away, not behind them, but around their path, but very far away. And I assess that they are discussing all together. What should we do? Do you want? Okay, I have to see. Okay, let's go there. But I want to let them time to choose to come, you know? And that's their actual choice. And in fact, you had a baby come up to you, was very curious, and I recall your hand touched the baby. And did the baby click? I was trying to understand your hand was paralyzed. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a video uh, we did, but it happens quite often. It's not paralyzed. You know, I don't know if you did use a machine to cut the grass. You use some type with roto, uh, and you after you get your hand that are a bit like... Uh, it's vibration. Vibration, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. You lose the feeling a bit about your hand. So I think the sound was so powerful that during like some minutes, you know, I was not really able to move my hand normally because it did something, you know, it did something like uh, it's not science fiction. You can do it if you use a drill. You have the same thing, ah. you know, and after your hand is a bit uh, shot. So, but it's I energy, it. it's energy. You get this vibration, it's energy that you could get from a drill, from a grass cutter, and after you feel it, uh, you really feel it in your hand. Well, then that's very interesting to me because the talk of energy and moving energy, and then you get into quantum physics and where whales play a part in this, right? And how they speak. Tell us the difference between a click and a coda. Clicks are yeah. sound they are doing permanently to look around the environment. So when they are in the open sea, they click regularly and one, two seconds. And then they see this big bubble of information around them. But when they start to be together, close to each other, they do seven, eight, ten clicks in a row. And that is studied by scientists. They say, okay, when they do this sound, they are what we say socializing. So the conclusion of it is, okay, this is the protocol they use to communicate. They do this spread of clicks when they are turning to each other, talking to each other. The other thing we know is they have dialects. So it means different tribes or pods of, of sperm whales, maybe sometimes even in the same location, like in Pacific, could use different right. arrangements in the way they use this coda, this spread of clicks. And this group, when they meet, they cannot really interact because it's like us, you know, they don't have the same dialects. So it's known for the orca, and it's known for uh, the sperm one. So we know scientifically, publication by Royal Med in Nature, that this guy has dialects, and that this guy uses this kind of sound when they are in social situation. What we don't know is how they use this coda, because now the theory of the science is more to say, okay, it's like a boss, you know? You just do click, 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 or click, 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 and then, okay, you have information just because we are against anthropomorphic. So we want this to be an arrangement of sound in time. There is even this crazy publication of scientists that compare it to the Tam Tam in Africa. Okay, yeah, yeah. All, all the smoke with the Indians. Yeah. But the yeah. problem with this thing is you cannot send a lot of information in Morse. It's so slow. So slow, you know. So I mean, that's why I went to this theory. When you see the brain, you know, you cannot even imagine this guy a way to talk like just making different with me and it take ages and you will not be able to send any information in that. Yeah, interesting. Have you ever played music for the whales underwater? Yeah, we did some experiments. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so that's funny because, for instance, this summer I was with this beluga whale in Norway. Maybe you heard about it, Vladimir. There is a beluga whale that escaped a Russian army uh, base. And now he's in Norway and I spent three months with him. So my goal was to, okay, great, I have a whale that is disposable. You know, he's there, I can spend time with him and he's still wild. Let's go there and see what I can do on a communication point of view. So 
I was going to see this well. And what you can expect from uh, beluga or dolphins, first thing you can expect is to get his ID because all of these animals, they do like us, you know. They have ID sounds. So it's proven for the pilot whale, for the orca, for the dolphins and the beluga. They use sounds to introduce themselves. A bit like if you're on the radio. If I was calling you, I would say, Fabrice, to... Because you don't yeah. see me, so you have to say, oh, okay, it's me. Because they, they communicate so far away in the ocean, they don't see each other. So I say, okay, let's go over, try to find this guy. I found him, spend time with him, and record his name. And see if I can get more voice, because then maybe I can also see where he's coming from, because he was in the wild when he was young. Because Beluga have also dialects. So we, you can compare the sound and say, okay, this guy is from Spitzberg or from Siberia or from Canada. Because you can know that. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's, yeah. That would that's be amazing. Funny. But when I came, the guy was saying, nothing. Impossible to get a sound. He was a bit playing super cool. Very, very difficult to get a sound. He was doing some sound when he was alone, playing, but with me, it was nothing. Uh, and it's something that I observed in some marine land, you know. They don't do so much sound with humans because... I think they are both done, you know, they are trying to sound out, and after they see we never answer, so it's okay, no way it's interesting to talk with them because I have no answer. So why? You should talk alone to us, you get nothing, you know? And when we are talking we're above the water, it's the water, everything is complicated. And then I was with my daughter, and I was trying to send him sounds, beluga sounds, nothing was working. And then we did put music, and he started to talk. And we got Amazing. three days of talking, he went crazy. So the way to break the wall with him was the music. So, yeah, for sure. And uh, the more funny thing, I don't know if you know the music, you know Princess Mononoke uh, movie? So it's this music. Wait, say that again. Whose music? Princess Mononoke, this uh, Studio Ghibli, Pr Japanese animated movie that is very yes, good. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, incredible. He was uh, totally hypnotized by it. Oh, well, I'm hypnotized by Studio Ghibli's movies myself. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Wow, what a beautiful, I could just sit on that experience for a long time to this communication through beauty, right? No, I think you have this uh, ability to read our emotions. You know, that's a very important point because we need facts to say, okay, yeah. this guy is saying that's not, that's not, okay, what I can give a fact that you can really rely on to say, okay, it's, it's true. We discovered 20 years ago that we have spindle cells or neuron neurons in our brain. Yeah. That basically are very specific neurons that we are thinking were well, just for apes and humans that allow us in our brain to feel what you are doing. So for instance, if you are eating a sandwich, in my brain, in my brain, these neuron neurons that will give you the same feeling and I will have the feeling of eating a sandwich because so I will be able to project myself into your feeling. And this is very scientific, you know, they just put medical imagery and they say, okay, you do that, okay, in his brain is doing the same thing. And it's fault, there is a lot of scientists that think that the beginning of consciousness, language and civilization, because it allows us to connect as humans, to imitate what the other were doing, to create the language, to communicate, to have all the facial expression, and that's where the human became human, you know? Getting yes. this ability to uh, that's the theory of mind. You're able to understand not only that the world think, but you are even able to access his thoughts and his emotions. And then we become human. We have empathy, we have solidarity, we have smart uh, way to communicate. And basically, this spindle cell of neuron neurons are the thing we say that made us human. And yes. then, when you go there, they just discovered recently that we will and some of them more than others, have a lot of spinal cells. But not only they have a lot of spinal cells, because some people, okay, they have bigger brain, a lot more in density. So then it means a lot. It's not like, you know, you would say, even a dolphin has more spinal cells, the one that has the more of it is the pilot whale, beluga have a lot too, and some whales have the big whale. So if we take what we know about the spinal cells from a very scientific point of view, that it creates you uh, the ability to have empathy, to have emotions, to be human. Yes. The first question I ask, okay, so the whale have more spin and some maybe there are more humans than the humans. It's a bit stupid to say, but why not? In the way we measure humanity. Yes. And the other thing, and I observe it, they have an incredible capacity to read all emotions. 
Because all the read emotion, I'm looking to your smile, I'm looking to your eyes, I'm looking to your posture, and I don't know where you are. That's what he's doing yeah. Facebook with his camera. You know, he's looking at his smartphone. And, okay, is that your man? But when we look to a well, there's no smile. There's no facial expression. So we are totally unable to read where they are, you know. Is this well angry, not angry? No one knows. But I can say you the well does it. And when I say he loves the music, I don't think he really loves the music. What he loves, my daughter was there, and this is the music she loves since she's a child. And yes. she was so emotional about sharing this music with his well. I think the well look at her and say, I'm with you. I see your emotion. <laughs> I see you happy. I want to be part of it. Like if I see a movie, I see an actor that is super emotional, I'm with him. I'm yes. crying with him. I'm feeling his emotion. But we are not able to do it with the well, but I definitely see in my experience that on the water they are able to do it. Different That's things incredible. are looking at your movement, they are looking at train. And in this way, they are smarter than us. Absolutely. So uh, first I want uh, listeners to understand that. So the spindle cells that you were speaking of, they're only found in humans, apes, and the whales. No, they were, initially, it, right? they were initially discovered in apes, and now we found them in a lot of different animals, more and more. But initially it was in macaque, and after in human, and there are a lot in human. But he, when we say we have a lot, if you go to somewhere, they have in density, three, four times more, you know, compared right, to the only, size. And so you cannot say it's just because they are bigger, you know. Right. No, you can't. So, I mean, to understand, it's not found in everything. It's not found in a fly or, you know, like a mouse or what I want people to understand that, to have this connection, because the fact is, is that there's a lot happening that's being done to the underwater protectors and the sounds. I have to wonder, I've done a lot of work with, you know, Oceana and stuff to stop the creation of man colonizing basically the sea, putting things in there, the, the ships, a cruise ship. Have you studied that at all of how much it affects them? Like it can actually kill the whales. They beach themselves, don't they? So it's a big subject. It was my work over the last 10 years to measure the sound of, yeah. of big work, big buildings on the sea, on these things. So, yes and no. Some species are very impacted. Mm -hmm. Usually, there are little species and they can be afraid by the sound. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, uh, you know, when you, there is uh, these fireworks and your dog went crazy or, or a horse. Or even a human, if we are maybe a, a tribe from Amazonia and you were in fireworks in New York, maybe you would be completely freaked out. And then they swim away to the surface and they make this dining accident. Most well, I would say, do more noise. That's the conclusion that uh, most of that still there are some noise, like military noise or the petrol exploration noise that can yeah. kill some dolphins and some species. And that's a bit stupid because there is a lot of, of ways to do it differently, you know. And I, I think, to be honest, on my point of view, it's getting better and better. The sound thing is the threat, but the real threat on, on the well, and it's no doubt about it, is the, what we call a ship strike. And there, you know, there is some regulation in the US to say when a boat gets out uh, from the harbor or in a specific area, there are mother and cat, don't go 25 knots because this big boat, uh, when they are on the path of the well, the well cannot hear it because there is this sound phenomenon that the sound going on the side, you don't hear it. So the main threat from the well is not the sound, it's really the ship strike. There is 100,000 boats cruising all around the world. And they, this guy, they should just slow down near, next to the coast. You know, they would lose 10 minutes, but they still, they go like mm. 25 knots in the middle of... There is a recent video, was a video of a well that was in the middle of the bay. You know, they saw it and trying to avoid all the ship. So it's not the noise for I think sometimes even the noise can be helpful for them because they use it for maybe echolocating passively. Like some of our subjects. But we have really to think about new way not to kill them just by the collision, you know. Yes. Is it still active that people can kill whales? Uh, there are some countries. I mean, Norway, they are one of the three countries that are still whaling, and that's a big subject because it's not uh, an ecologic subject. I had the chance to talk uh, last year, by chance, with the Minister of Environment in Norway. I didn't know he was the Minister of Environment, but just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so talking That's after the best. Hour, say, oh, I'm a Mr. Weber. <laughs> they take it always this way. They say, okay, it's sustainable. And it is. 
if you kill uh, five percent of the uh, species and there is enough, it's sustainable. So then I answered him, yeah, but humans are sustainable also. I want it. We don't eat humans. We don't need to eat five uh, percent of humans every year, but we don't do it. So it's not an ecological question. It's an yeah. ethical question. It's the same question if we don't accept the idea we eat human or kill human, there is a reason for that. And the reason is very simple. We don't accept this idea because it creates a lot of suffering. I have children. If someone kills my children, I will be devastated for all my life, all my family. Because we are humans, you know? Because in fact, we have a lot of mirror neurons that connect us and it creates us a massive desperation when you will lose someone. And there was a beautiful experience that was made uh, by a scientist in Central Park. I can take you this example. So she came, she killed some crow in Central Park. Maybe you heard about it with a mask. No, no. And then she was studying what were doing the crow and they went mad, you know, on the crow. Crow are quite smart animal. And they were going around the body of the other crow and they were like that during three days. Yeah. And after she came back one year after with the same mask. And what happened? The crow went mad again. They remembered her. They remembered she killed someone. So not only they were devastated by it, they still have the pain inside them one year after. This animal is shared with us this ability. If, and after she took another experience, she went, she killed a pigeon in the middle of the other pigeon. In science, eh? sometimes they are a bit wild. And you know what happened? What happened? Nothing. The other pigeon the continued. They didn't care. Oh, we were not able to see it. It's not as simple. Maybe they were freaking out and they don't express it. But obviously, we are just continuing to do business as usual. So I really believe not all the animals are social, are able to have empathy, to have a theory of mind, and some animals share it with us. And we see the whale and the orca, they are mourning, you know? When they have a dead baby orca, there's an orca yes. that was uh, carrying our baby for three weeks. The yes. is the same. So if we are able to understand we cannot kill a human because you create so much psychological suffering because killing someone is killing someone. You know, you're dead, you're going to die. Okay. But imagine the psychological suffering of all the people around yeah. you. And if we are able to understand that for a human, maybe we should assess that some animal share it with us and even some have more than us. And that a fact, we have more neural neurons. And they behave like it. They are very social. They have a lot of solidarity. They do this massive stranding sometimes when there is one on the beach. So we can imagine, maybe not sure, but we can imagine they, they share with us this ability to suffer from the loss of another. And then it's totally unacceptable yes. to do it. You know, I'm a vegetarian, but only six days a week. I totally accept the idea that we kill animals to eat it. This is the planet we are living on. But not any animals, and not any way, not growing it the industrial way, and not every day at breakfast, at lunch, and getting fat. You know, we have to make some choice to limit it. I think, uh, make some category. Not everything is the same, you know? Yes, agree. Do you think that this would come down to educating our children and starting at the very beginning? Like, how do we create this empathy? Uh, perhaps if you do crack the code and you can understand their language, right? And then they say to you, I heard you in your other interview that they say you wanted to know where the gold is. But what if they said to you, you know, hey, stop killing us. Like, do you think then people would understand? So what, what my dream is yes. to make this thing for sure. Be happy, huh? Crack the code yeah. and like, Change everything, but okay. Maybe there's one chance on one million I'm doing. I, I do this, so I still want. But to be more pragmatic, uh, what I'm doing right now is I just want to share the experience I had being in the water with this guy and just understanding it, being there, you know, looking at their eyes, looking at what I knew it. I didn't have to go and to make a, a study to say they were smart, careful, thinking about me. Sometimes you don't need words, you know? Yeah. It just happens. But how can you share it? You know? Not everybody can leave you a well in the water. And honestly, when you look it at the TV, it's just, okay, I look at the well. And then, 
I decided to use virtual reality to uh, study the well. But by the way, it's an incredible way to share the experience. You, know, you can be there with the well, the well can be looking at you. And now you can reach a lot of million of people, you know, it's exploding. You can be in China and through the well. So I think there is a massive thing to do. And that's what I'm trying to do. I didn't move in the York time, I didn't move in French, uh, I didn't move in Norway, to share as much as possible with these people, maybe to explain a bit, but just not let also people live a thing and make their own yes. opinion. If I want to prove I've loved someone, oh, I will make it scientifically. Yes. Can you prove love? Can you measure love? And it's the most important thing in humanity, yes. you know? And this thing we cannot measure. So are you going to make a scientific article to measure love? Yes. You cannot. So this thing, I think, more than... You can work on the language because it's scientific and say, okay, this is data. But you can also just share with the people what you live when you are swimming the well and feel the love of them, you know? The love of them they have for themselves, for their own children, but also the love they have for us. You know, my last experience, we had a mother that was bringing a calf and leaving and let us the calf. Or we had this experience of the birth and the mother was bringing the baby for us. She was just able to project herself to say, I want to show my baby to this guy because they will be happy to share it with me. So they have this ability and you can feel it on the water. So my goal is to share with as much people as possible this magical moment where you, you have no doubt in your heart that they are like us. Yes, I think that is wonderful. I would love to ask you, Fabrice, how we can support your work and where we can find you. So uh, we have a website, darewin.org, where you can uh, follow what we are doing. Uh, right now, we are not uh, really looking for funding because, to be honest with you, we try to be a bit low profile because we had a lot of exposure three years ago because we were awarded by the UN uh, at the Solutions Summit as uh, one of the best projects on the planet. And after we had this article in the New York Times, and we had a lot of attack from the scientific community that are saying this thing is right, this is serious. It was very difficult to, in a way, uh, to go over this, you know, because a real will to, to say this guy is bullshit. So we decided we do our thing on our own. And we come back when we have something serious to show to the people on the scientific point of view, some kind of, not proof, but good evidence. We are working on it and we have some interesting stuff happening, but it's a long process because we have to develop antenna, 3D printing, computers, uh, coding, and we do it all by all. But it's okay and it's going forward. But on the other aspect of virtual reality, I would say just go and see the movie. They are available online. Uh, you can find them on the PlayStation. You can find them on some application or on the Oculus. And you can even find them online. Uh, just leave the experience to be well and just uh, talk about it or, around you, you know, and try just to make it some call for action. You know, if you accept the idea that we share this planet with over a sentient and smart beings that share the emotion like us, question the way you use this planet and how much Animals you eat in your life. It's not I ask you to stop, you know, I'm, I'm doing it. I was vegetarian two years. I thought it was counterproductive because everyone was looking at me like if I was uh, this annoying guy that wanted to give lesson to the other. So I chose my strategy. It's okay. I'm doing it once a week. I choose what I'm eating. Very good one. That was grown with nature. And the other time, I just eat vegetable and super cool. I'm fit and everything is okay. Well, I saw this movie, you know, the, the game changer, you know, all these champions are vegetarian. So just think about it. You, know, you want to continue to eat animals, just do it, you know. But just think about how much you are doing and how much pain you create. With that. Is it worth uh, the pleasure you get from it? And do you even get pleasure from it? Yeah. So use this Excellent point. experience to uh, change your point of view and talk about it. Become an ambassador of this and uh, I say we are not uh, alone on this planet and we have to share it with the others. We have the beautiful experience to be alive with them now. You know, let's be friends. Yes, let's be friends, right? Where is your next expedition? Where are the waters taking you next? So I'm going to Canary Island. There is a beautiful little island where there are a lot of pilot whales. And the very interesting fact is the human on this island, they use a whistle language for centuries. So I'm talking from one valley to another at kilometer of whistles. And the pilot are doing the same on the water. So I just want to be there to 
to study the web as I do usually and how they use this result to identify themselves because they use clicks, but they also use whistle to ID themselves. And after I go on the land, I learn to whistle with the units and to see if there's something to do with an artistic or cultural or scientific point of view, you know. Yeah, that's incredible. How long will you be there for? As long as it takes you? One month. One month. Yeah. Beautiful. So we've come to the end of our interview and, and you mentioned before that, you know, you were doing this and there's a lot, you know, and the UN came around and everything, you know, it's a big article. And then people attacked you, people who I would hope would want to work with you. And so you pulled back, but you continue to do this on your own. Why? Why do you wake up in the morning and say, ah, today I'm just going to make a garden? Like, why do you continue to be the change? Why do you continue this? When I say we are doing it alone, not exactly, you know, we are working, uh, for instance, with the Prince of Monaco on these explorations. So we have still good opportunity, but we don't communicate so much because, you know, it's counterproductive to say, hey, we think this is like this, but we cannot prove it. But to be honest, what I say always, I say, okay, I have an idea, an hypothesis, or maybe a theory, that is an intuitive way of thinking. And... We are in a period right now where the science say, if you say something, you'll prove it. But this is not the way it happens. You know, Darwin, he had an idea. It was proven 100 years after with the DNA. Einstein, he had an idea. And after it was proven five years after with the solar eclipse. All these guys, you know, they had this little line and said, okay, maybe it could be like that. And after they struggled to find the idea. So I think it's not first forbidden to have an idea. That's the first thing, even if you cannot prove it. And you can even accept your ideas completely crazy. Maybe it's one chance on 1,000 is true. See, why not? And maybe I have one chance on 1,000, I can prove it. So at the end, I have one chance on 1 million, I can do it. But see, it's worth for two reasons. The first reason is the journey is beautiful because trying to see if I'm right or wrong, I'm just going to study well and explore this beautiful world. So I love it. So even if I fell, I would have been very happy to try. And the second thing is, if I manage to do it, what a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's only that, you know. You can take a lot of risk if there is big expectation. Yeah. So the expectations are just, for me, incredible. Being able to, not to show something, I think now the strategy is more to say maybe it's more serious subject than what we think. And some people are starting to go there because there was this exposure, even people from Harvard. So I say, oh, why not? Maybe it's possible. Let's look for it. So if we manage just to push some labs, some real scientists, and there's two people, and after 10 people or 100 people looking for it, and it becomes politically correct to say that, then maybe there is more chance that this thing happen. I hope so. Well, Fabrice, thank you so much for being on today and for being the change. I want to remind everyone that they can find you at Darwin. So it's uh, like Darwin, but it's Darwin, D-A-R-E-W-I-N.org. And you can follow Fabrice there and all his expeditions. Beautiful, beautiful photos, incredible images and the clicks and the sounds that it's on my, uh, I can't show you right now, but it's on my screensaver right now. You and a gigantic sperm whale. It's, it's beautiful to look at. So thank you so much for your work and for all you do. Thank so you. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and are inspired. We grow with supporters and listeners like you. So please share this podcast with your community and follow us on Instagram at bethechange.nyc. And to learn more about our guests and what you can do to be the change, go to our website at www.bethechange.nyc. That's bethechange.nyc. Thank you and be well.